Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, latest session of Geometry, Cosmology, Spirituality. Uh, it's Sunday morning where I am here in the UK. Um, I hope you're having a good day wherever you are. Now, today I'm going to go back to some of what I was talking about. About a month and a half ago, I was talking about Venus, but then uh, the solstice came along and labyrinth came up, so I diverted onto them for the last two sessions. So I'm going to return back to well a particular aspect of Venus, but also something that you find within uh, a couple of other planets in our solar system as well. And that is um, instances of the numbers five and eight. This is an image of uh, a character, a sort of semi-mythical figure called Tannhäuser. Uh, he's a German minnesänger. He is an actual real person who existed in the past, but he's been quite mythologized in his aftermath. Uh, you may recognize the name um, because it was uh, the name of uh, an opera by Wagner, which was uh, about this character. He's a, a medieval troubadour or minnesänger, as uh, they were called in the region of Europe that's now Germany. Now here, Tannhäuser is depicted uh, as a Teutonic knight. Uh, they were a military order, sort of similar to the Knights Templar, but again, from that region that's now Germany. And of course, being a troubadour, you have this association with love and singing about love and longing. And so therefore, if one looks wider at this association uh, with love, or if one looks perhaps cosmologically, then we have an association with Venus. Now this, comes into this mythology of Tannhäuser because he's said to have gone down into the underworld um, or the, the underworld where Venus was and to have worshipped Venus for a year. Now, there's a whole story uh, around this, and this is part of what you find in Wagner's opera, but it goes back uh, before uh, Wagner himself. Now, the association that we have in this image or the possible association that we have with Venus is in that foliage that is on either side of him. Because if you count uh, the greenery, as you can see, it's made up of single leaves and then sets of three uh, oak leaves. So you have one, two, three, four, five on one side of him. And on the other side of him, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now these two numbers, five and eight, they have this uh, Venusian association um, wherever you see instances of Venus um, being described symbolically, you'll very often have these two numbers, because they're two numbers that we see in relation to Venus. But as we'll see, there's also a couple of other planetary bodies where we can see uh, these two numbers uh, as well, beyond Venus. Now, first of all, let's just begin with the numbers themselves. Five and eight are consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So therefore, the relationship of eight to five is very similar to the relationship of 1.618 to, uh, to one, which is the golden ratio. Now it's actually 1.6 to one when you have eight to five. And so it's one of these approximations that you have uh, within the Fibonacci numbers. Now, if we look geometrically at five, and eight. So on the left, you see there's the pentagram star, the five pointed star. And on the, uh, the right, we have the eight pointed star, the octogram. Now, as you can see, there's a highlighted area in the middle with these dotted lines in the sense that the circle that contains this pentagon, which is in the middle of the pentagram star, and the circle that is contained by the octagon that's at the center of the octogram star. Now, they are virtually identical in size. So you have this relationship whereby the container circle is the same size, the container circle of both stars, as you can see, as the dotted lines here show. And then that circle that inter uh, interacts with the, the middle form of the star is also virtually identical. Now, if we said that the radius of the outer container circle was one, then the radius of this circle here is 0.382 whereas the radius of this circle here is 0.383. So they're virtually identical. 
And what I'll show in a couple of weeks' time is how this relationship is used within uh, a chapel in Wales Cathedral, which uh, appears to be an image of planet Venus as the morning star. Now, I've shown this on various occasions before. You may have seen me shown this uh, in the past. Uh, the Venus pentagram uh, works in such a way that every time you have a conjunction between uh, Earth here depicted with the blue circle, Venus here and Sun in the middle, every time there's a conjunction, a straight line between them, this happens on the five points of a pentagram star. So this is the next time they conjunct, and we can draw a line from where they conjuncted before down to here. And then the next time they conjunct, 1.6 years later, and of course 1.6 is, what well, I said, 8 divided by 5. Now 1.6 years later, they conjunct here, and then another 1.6 years, and finally 1.6 years, and they're back pretty much, but not quite, where they started. And so of course 5 times 1.6 is 8, because it's an 8-year cycle. Now the number 8 shows itself uh, in a slightly different way with the venus octogram relationship. Um, Every time Earth returns to the starting point, which of course is one year, uh, we look at where Venus is. So after one year, Earth is back at the starting point, but Venus has gone around once and a bit more and ended up here. So we draw a line to where she now is. Now another year, one year later, Earth is back at the starting point, Venus is now here. And this keeps going. So every year, Venus will give us a, a new point to plot so that we can plot out the eight-pointed star. So this is how you have five and eight with Venus. And this is because the orbital period of Earth in relation to Venus is very similar to 1.618 to 1. It's actually, it's very close to 13 to 8, which is, uh, again, another Fibonacci relationship. Now, back to this diagram that we looked at a few minutes ago. Another way of looking at this diagram, or at these circles that we have, the circle the small one in the middle in relation to the larger one that contains the star. Um, this is something that you see also with the planet Mercury, but fascinatingly, you see it in two different ways at the same time. So in one sense, we could be looking at the actual size of the planet. So if this is the size of Mercury, this is the size of Earth. But on top of that, if we were looking down at the solar system, say from above, if we say that the sun is here in the middle, then the regularized sort of mean orbit of Mercury would be this circle here, and the mean orbit of Earth would be this circle here. So both in terms of the orbital proximity, but also the size, you have this relationship. And of course, because five and eight are so similar, it's actually more similar to what you get in the eight-pointed star, this relationship of Mercury to Earth. Um, but of course, because they're so similar, you can sort of say it in a sense that they're both they're both there. Now, finally, the other planetary example of five and eight is Jupiter. You have these polar cyclones in the sense of there being some at the North Pole, some at the South Pole. Now, as you can see with the image on the left with uh, the North Pole, um, there are eight of these cyclones around uh, the pole itself, whereas at the South Pole, there's five. So again, five and eight, it's just such a common relationship that you find in, in many different contexts. And if we come back down to Earth again, uh, you see, of course, Fibonacci numbers in what's known as the phylotaxis or uh, the leaf counting uh, in the spirals that you get in flowers such as this one. Now, you can see five and eight if you begin from here. I'll count. Well, you see how there are spirals going. There are some coming out in this direction and then shallower ones coming out in that direction. So I'll come in from this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then I'll begin from this one and count outwards. One, two, three, four, five. Now you get lots of different Fibonacci numbers and also sometimes non-Fibonacci numbers, which still um, reflect the golden ratio in the sense that there would be a larger number in one direction and a smaller number in the other direction. And their relationship approximates the golden ratio. Right, so I want us to draw, I shall stop sharing screen and switch my camera on. Um, hello, welcome everyone, good to see all of you. 
Right, I'm going to highlight or hopefully spotlight myself. Oh yes, spotlight for everyone. Okay, it's nice to actually be doing one at a really reasonable time of day. I do have two rather crazy ones coming up. Um, I'm only doing another six and two of them, I think one's gonna be about three in the morning and one about four in the morning. So feel free to watch them online if you want to. But of course, you're welcome to join me, especially if you're in a, a time zone that suits those times better. Right, I shall switch my drawing camera on. I just realised I haven't sorted out the lighting. That's what happens when you're rushing around on a Sunday morning. Right, okay. So as you can see, I've got a piece, just a piece of A4 is fine. Um, that's what I'll be drawing on for this. And we're going to draw um, a pentagram and an octogram star, but we're going to actually do them. We're going to overlap them so you can really get a sense of how this circle that's at the centre of the two of them uh, relates with the two stars. It's quite an interesting process. You can sort of actually, like, we'll draw the pentagram first and then we'll see how the octogram relates to it. So with this piece of paper, it needs to be blank on both sides because we're going to divide the circle up on this side and then we'll turn the paper over and draw the polygon star on this side. Now, if you could uh, begin with uh, a radial measurement of three uh, inches. Right, I'm going to go into the middle of the page. Oh, well, there's a sense of relief every time you draw a circle. In goes the horizon line through the center of the circle. And then using that radial measurement on the compasses, from the eastern point, so we can get these two points, and the equivalent on the other side. And then we'll use these two points to find the middle path that runs between them. So from this point, making a mark like so, and from this point, one that crosses it.
and in goes that middle path. Now, for those of you who are, are in the habit of drawing geometry, this will no doubt will be very familiar stuff. Right, as you can see, I'm now using those two intersections, which I made just a few minutes ago, to draw in another vertical line and another one on this side. And this is to give us these two points here, which, uh, if we're drawing accurately, are at the midpoint between center and circumference. And now we can put in the the eyes of Jagannath, as um, my teacher Keith Critchlow used to call these two circles. We're going to put in circles from here and here, which touch the center and the circumference, and it gives uh, an image of Jagannath, which is one of the names of Krishna. I'm going to put in this uh, V shape. Like so. This is the next radial measurement that we want. And then we need to extend the compasses to this measure. Should hopefully find it's the same on the other side. Right, so I shall highlight points. Now I'm going to write number five next to the five points that I'm highlighting here. And um, <laughs> the reason why I'm doing that will become clearer in a few minutes because we'll do some other points in a while next to which we'll write the number eight. Now, as ever, always make sure that you get the right point here because th these two points are very close together when we divide by five, and it's just a very common mistake to to get the wrong one. So make sure you're highlighting these ones that are coming from the arc 
And once you've got these five points, we can do uh, pinprick holes through paper in those five positions. Now, in practical terms, there's just a slightly e there's a sort of a particular way of drawing this, like the order in which we're going to do everything, because um, I take a bit too long to explain, but um, I'll probably explain as we go along. So hopefully you can turn your paper over once you put those pinprick holes in, and you should see five little pinprick holes. Uh, you may see a few others, so like where we've also placed the compasses in other places. So make sure that you're um, identifying the correct pinprick holes. So they'll quite possibly you'll have one in the middle at the bottom, which is this point here. Now we don't want to be using that one, so just make sure it's these five that you're guessing into your focus now. Now we are also going to need uh, the hole in the middle. We won't need that right now, but I suppose we might as well just do that while we're here. And we are eventually going to be using that. Right now, you don't need to do what I'm about to do here. I'm just doing this so that you can sort of identify where the five pinprick holes are on my work so you can see how I'm uh, interacting with them. So obviously pentagonal arrangement. And I'm going to miss one point each time. So if we imagine that we're going, you know, from one to the next, one to the next, well, I'm going to miss one because we're going to draw the pentagram. Now again, miss one. And again, miss one, and um, we start to get the lines crossing. Miss one and go to here. And this is that, that movement of uh, Venus, um, as we see from you know, a geocentric or heliocentric view. It works both ways. Now, some of those numbers I was talking about, you know, 1 to 1.618, uh, if we went from here to the next door point, if that were 1, then this line would be 1.618. So in that sense, you could say that if we said that from here to here was 5, from here to here would be approximately 8. Right, let's now go into that hole in the middle. I think at this point we shall put in uh, the circle in the middle. We'll put the outer circle in a bit later on. Oh, a fly has come to join me. I've had to shut my cat in another, another room because she'll just end up jumping up in the middle of the diagram. She knows where the action is, you see. Or perhaps where the silence is rather than the action. So this is our, um, our Mercury circle, you could say. The Earth circle, like I said, I'm going to put that in in a while. I want us to get our eight points for the eight-pointed star first before we put the circle in. Right, so if you've got this far, we now need to turn back. And what we're going to do is bring in the eight-fold division. Now, we already have one, two, three, four. So we just need to find... Uh, the midpoints here. It's really quite straightforward. We just need to put the points of the compasses back in and re-establish the radial measurement. Now, whenever I do this, I always use the circle that you've drawn. Don't go back to your ruler. And you can just check, you know, I generally check on both sides and then I sort of know if I've got the centre. But you should hopefully have the hole clearly established there in the middle. And uh, once you've re-established that radial measurement. 
then let's go into the northern point of the circle first. And I'm going to do marks on either side. So these marks are horizontally level with that point where the point of my compass is within the paper. Now I'm going to do the equivalent thing down below from the southern point of my horizon. Again, horizontally level at that point. Now I'm going to use east and west for the next thing, and I'm going to, again, the same radial measurements and crossing over these lines that we've just put in, one above and one below. Now for these, we don't need to draw these lines all the way through. We just need to draw them up as far as the circumference of the circle. So as you can see, I'm going through these two. Hopefully you're going through the center of the diagram as well. All you need is to go that far. But that's enough because we're just wanting to find the particular point on the actual circumference of the circle. <clears throat> so we'll do the equivalent thing this way too. Now, we already have the top point, so we're going to use that for the eight-pointed star as well. But um, the points that we're going to need here are in there, so I'm writing eight next to that one. This one here, eight. Sorry, Tom, I think I've used the wrong radial measurement. Could you just um, clarify which one it was again, please? I've ended up with crosses in the wrong place. Oh, these ones here? Yeah. Um, oh, right. It's the same radial measurement as the... Uh, I mean, the thing is, to be honest, it doesn't matter which one you use, as long as you get something, as long as you're using the same measurement from both of these points. So I happen to use uh, the radial measurement. <laughs> And that gave me that. But if you did one that was a bit bigger, okay. as long as both of the measurements from you know either point that you're making the cross from are the same, and it's outside of the circle, it should be fine. Because you're essentially finding the middle axis between these two points. Thank you. So does that help? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Right, so as you can see, I've drawn the number eight uh, next to um, eight of the points. Uh, obviously, this one here is used for the five and the eight. Now, the reason why we're doing this now is because if we were to have drawn the circle in on this side, then you might not see your pinprick holes. So we'll put them in now. So you already have this one. Don't worry about that one. But put in all, all of these points that have the number eight next to them. Right, I'm going to take this opportunity before I put in the circle. I'm going to highlight these points. Um, 
if you want, you can put like a little line pointing towards the point if you want. If you perhaps don't want to mark your work at all, because then you can rub out the little lines later. You know, if you did something like that, then you'd be able to sort of, you know, be showing where that point is to yourself. It's just really that when we put in the circle here, it may blot out um, the pinprick hole. You might not be able to see it. So that's just why I'm being a bit particular about it. So the point at the top is one of the eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, let's put in the outer circle, put in the Earth circle, which of course should be the radius that you have on your compasses if when you did these, these crosses here, you were using the radial measurement of circle. But this is what you want. You want the radial measurement of the main circle on the other side. Better right. Right, you might want to use uh, another um palette. I'm going to use red. Um, or you could just do perhaps a stronger pencil line, just something to perhaps distinguish. The eight pointed star that we're about to draw from the five pointed star that you already have. Now, the thing that I want you to watch as you draw this I mean, if you're used to drawing an octogram, a stellated octogram star, then I won't really need to tell you how to do it. I mean, what you do is um, if you're this is your beginning point, you just count one, two, three, and you go to the third. And then from here, it would be one, two, three, go to the third, one, two, three, go to the third, and so on. Now, obviously, I'll draw it so you can copy me as I go along if you want. But the thing to watch out for is see how these lines that you draw in this octogram star uh, interact with this circle that we have here. And then you can really get a sense of what this relationship is between five and eight in geometric terms. So I'm going to begin from here and count one, two, three, and draw down to here. Now, you see straight away, this red line that I've put in, uh, it tangents that circle in the middle. And this, of course, is because of that relationship that I showed you earlier between five and eight, whereby you have uh, the circle in the middle contains the pentagon, but is contained by the octagon, which, of course, is about to happen as we draw this octogram star. So now from here, one, two, three. And again, we get another tangent. And of course, this is going to happen every time. We'll get that tangential relationship. One, two, three. One, two, three. Obviously, as you can see, I'm only counting the points uh, that aren't in the pentagram, except for that one at the top there, which is one, two, three. Three. This eight-pointed star that we're in the process of drawing 
one, two, three, is how um, the planet Venus was depicted in Babylon. Uh, Ishtar is depicted as a stellated eight-pointed star. And then finally, back up, one, two, three, back up to the top. And again, tangenting the circle as we have done on every occasion. I think I'll just highlight that circle again, just to emphasize the relationship. And so there we have that circle, which is contained by the octagon, but contains the pentagon. Now, like I say, this relationship is used in the design of the cathedral here in Wales in a chapel that appears to symbolize uh, the planet Venus as the morning star and i think i'll well we can draw that relationship uh, in the session in a couple of weeks time which is also on a sunday thank goodness uh, sunday around about midday i think I'll, it's uh, about that sort of time right now i'm just going to go back to my slides to finish off Now, this is a course that uh, I should be running here in the city of Wales for Michaelmas uh, about the symbolism of the pentagram and spiritual protection. Uh, we'll do a bit of wood parquetry, which is another thing that I do. If you're just used to me as a geometry teacher, you may not be aware that I also teach um, uh, wood parquetry, woodwork. Um, and we'll do an image of uh, Sir Gawain's uh, shield, which is a pentagram on uh, a red shield. We'll also produce a labyrinth and there'll also be uh, an event where we walk up to um, St. Michael's Wood, which is a little bit of woodland owned by Rupert Sheldrake. He had a, an event there last year and he's going to do another one this year. So that'll be going on in late September. And there's a, another course. I'm going to actually do one of my own online courses. Finally, I've been sort of meaning to do this for ages. Um, and this will be in October. So you can see the dates there. So from it'll be the final one of these sessions will be October the 2nd. And then two days later on the Friday, October the 4th, um, I'll begin uh, this course. Now I haven't, I'm just about to have um, a website set up. So this red writing here is denoting where I'm going to finally put the link that you can click on to pay for the course. Um, but the website will be ready in a couple of weeks. So do feel free to join me on that one. Obviously, because it's online, you can you don't need to be down here in Somerset. You can come in from wherever you want to. Uh, so do feel free to join me for that. Now, the next session is, yes, at midday, of course, midday uh, on Sunday in two weeks time for uh, the new moon. So please do join me for that as well. And I think that might be, yes, that'll be the last time I do something at a really reasonable time, except for the final session. The final session will also be a reasonable time too. Right now, let me get back to my camera to say hello and goodbye. Thank you very much for joining me again and uh, do join me for future sessions. And uh, I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks for joining me for this one and have uh, a good day wherever you are. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.